everybody, welcome to our How to Streamline Your Tier 2 and Tier 3 Literacy Intervention with the Science of Reading Training Workshop. I'm Michaela. And I'm Corey. And we work at Ascend Smarter Intervention. We are a group of educational therapists with backgrounds in research, psychology, and education who have a private practice working with students directly, as well as training educators around the world. Up until now, we've worked with over 500 students of varying ages and abilities, analyzing growth trajectories and offering literacy intervention services. And we've worked with over 25,000 educators around the world, supporting over 250,000 students. For today's training, we want to know if that we want to know, excuse me, if you are specifically looking for things that you should be including in an evidence-based lesson. If you've been trying to figure out how to squeeze all of the necessary components into a lesson, and or if you're feeling like there is never enough time to create a cohesive and streamlined lesson plan. If any of these points resonate with you, this training is going to resonate with you today. A few quick notes as we're jumping in, we are going to go through a lot of information today. We call this PD and PJs, professional development in your pajamas because we want it to be laid back and casual and fun. We don't want it to be a super formal, strict training. So feel free to push pause, feel free to rewind as needed so that you can follow along and fill out this lesson planning guide throughout the training so that by the end, you have a comprehensive, complete lesson plan to use with your own students. If you haven't downloaded this yet, you can grab it at the button below. Another quick note as we're jumping in is that real, happen, real learning happens in real life. This is one of our favorite quotes by Jim Knight. We're gonna go through a lot of hypotheticals today. We'll use a lot of examples, but sometimes it can feel overwhelming until you're in it. Let the training wash over you. Again, you can pause and rewind as needed and know that as you're implementing this with your own students, things are going to feel easier. Another note is that this is a no judgment space. There will be time where we ask you to pause the video and reflect on your own instruction. We are not offering any judgment as we ask any of these reflection questions, and we don't want you to put any judgment on yourself either. Another quote that we really like is, do the best you can with what you have. And so up until this point, if you've been doing the best you can, that's all we can ask for. After today, you'll have more information on how you can move forward. So all of that said, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Corey. So we are going to be talking about a number of things today, but we always like to follow the why, what, how, what if framework. And so first we're gonna start with why science of reading? Why is everybody talking about this? And then we'll move through what we're including and how to fill out your lesson planning guide. And then we'll address some of those what ifs as you get thinking. So first up, why? Why is everyone talking about the science of reading and what does that mean anyway? So according to the NAEP report in 2022, we had over 67% of fourth graders who were not reading at a proficient level. Now this is post COVID, things are continuing to be a challenge. And what we notice is that even as students get older and transition into the eighth grade, these numbers are not moving. So at eighth grade, we have 69% of eighth graders who are not reading at a proficient level. So if students aren't reading at that proficient level by fourth grade, they are not closing the gap afterwards. So it's super important that we figure out how do we support these students. The other thing that's important here is that students who aren't reading at a proficient level, not only are they struggling academically, but they are four times more likely to drop out of high school. They are more likely to come in contact with the juvenile court system, and they are more likely to end up in poverty. So again, we know that this issue is massive and definitely something that is worth thinking about how to address. So why is everybody talking about SOAR or the science of reading that we've lovingly taken down to SOAR? <laughs> So the reason that we're talking about it is because it works. So when we follow those science of reading principles, what we're seeing is that students are gaining standard score points, which means not only are they making growth, but they're actually closing the gap against their peers in decoding, 
spelling, reading fluency, comprehension, again, closing the gap. So catching up to those peers and they're doing this quickly. So for many students, following these science of reading based instruction principles leads to one to two grade levels of growth in just six months, which completely changes their lives, which is why everybody's talking <laughs> about the science of reading. So what is the science of reading? There's a lot of misconceptions. So it's important to recognize that the science of reading is truly a collective body of evidence that comes from the research, which helps us to understand how the brain develops literacy skills, where some breakdowns may be occurring, and how best to support students using approaches validated by the research. It's not a curriculum. It's not a specific way of instructing every concept. It is the body of evidence. It is, it is the body of research that's come together that helps us understand what to do next. So how does this align with writing? Well, it's called the science of reading, but we always kind of wish it was called the science of reading and writing because reading and writing are reciprocal processes. So essentially they're just two sides to the same coin. So for every reading process, there's a reciprocal writing process that students have. So just like students have receptive understanding things and expressive ability to express and share things through oral language skills, they have receptive and expressive written language skills as well. So we're gonna be talking about three key models. There is a lot of research, but what we've done is boiled it down to these three key models, which are really a good umbrella of the science of reading as a whole. And so these three key models include the literacy processing triangle by Mark Seidenberg, the five core components of literacy that was established by the National Reading Panel in 2000, and then the simple view of reading, which has also given way to many advancements since the simple view of reading came out in 1986. So the first thing that we were going to talk about is the literacy processing triangle. So Mark Seidenberg calls this the eternal triangle, but we've lovingly re-termed it the literacy processing triangle. And the idea here is that the brain is creating a neural connection between these three very distinct processes, but that those processes have to come together to be able to read or write effectively. So one of the first things that we like to think about is phonology. So the understanding of the sound structure of the language. So for example, b at. They're all individual sounds that would blend together to give us the word bat. Another thing we think about is orthography. So our understanding of the visual print or the actual visuals that we see. So that stick with a little half circle is a B and then we have an A and then we have a T and we're recognizing those individual pictures that we've made to create letters and those letters pair with sounds and that's creating a connection between orthography and phonology. And then the last piece that we think about is semantics. Very important here. This is our ability to make meaning out of what we hear or out of what we see. So for example, if we heard the word bat or if we read the word bat, we would be thinking, is this a nocturnal winged creature? Is this a baseball bat? Is this an action to bats? Um, and we're gonna use a lot of context clues and vocabulary knowledge in order to do this but that connection needs to come together in less than half of a second to read and write effectively. So we need to make sure that we are targeting each of those areas and each of those neural connections within our instruction. Now, how do we do this? So there's another model that came out from the National Reading Panel that talked about the five core components of reading. Again, we've decided it's the five core components of literacy because again, <laughs> reading and writing are reciprocal processes. But essentially what that told us is that we need to be providing instruction in phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and reading comprehension. And essentially what that is, is that's just helping us to create that connection in that neural processing. So the neural processing is just what's going on in the brain and these direct skills are what we can teach within the classroom or within an intervention setting to be building those neural connections. Then we have the simple view of reading. So the simple view of reading that came out in 1986 essentially told us that there's two key pieces that we need to think about when we think about a student's reading ability. The first being word recognition. So a student's ability to recognize words as they're reading. And then the second being able to comprehend language. So once you've read those words, are you able to comprehend what it means? Now advancements were made as we continued, what we started to see was we saw Scarborough's rope, right, which was an advancement as well. And so that essentially just took us into what does word recognition mean? What are the skills that actually come together? 
And same thing for language comprehension. What are the skills that we need to actually comprehend language? And so this is a really common visual. Um, we're seeing a lot more of this, which is great um, because it does help us to understand that it's not just word recognition and language comprehension, there's a lot of skills that make that up. Now, as we get into the most recent update to the simple view of reading, we got the active view of reading. So Duke and Cartwright in 2021 came up with a new model, which essentially says a lot of the same things. We still have word recognition, we still have language comprehension, but they also stressed the importance of the bridging processes. So those two things are not just distinct pieces of the rope, but they actually have skills that have to come together in order for that to bind at all. And then also the importance of active self-regulation or executive functioning. Executive functioning is huge. And post-COVID, we see this as an even bigger area that we need to make sure that we are addressing within our literacy instruction. So We've put together a combined model because essentially that's the three models and that really encompasses a lot of the research that's out there. And so the way that we look at this is just by taking that literacy processing triangle and then mapping the five core components of literacy on top of it, and then making sure that we're addressing how does that active self-regulation and executive functioning play in. So you're gonna see this throughout as we're thinking about our lesson planning and what this looks like. We're using this model, we're using this image to make sure that everything that we're doing and everything we're putting into a lesson is addressing one of these areas. And that ideally we're also making that connection between each of them as well. So, quick reflection, how does this align with what you're currently doing? The good thing is, is no matter what you're doing, if you've been teaching and you are helping support students with their literacy, you are hitting one of these areas, no doubt. You may be hitting multiples of these areas. So what you want to be thinking about is what are the areas that you're already doing really well? Keep doing that. There's a lot that you're doing amazing. Your students are making a ton of growth, again, regardless of what your approach has been. But then what we can start to do is think about, okay, what are the things that are new or what are the things that maybe I haven't been hitting before and how can I start to incorporate some of those areas as well? So moving into what? So what do we do? What do we, how do we take all the research and take that information and actually put a lesson plan together? What do we need to include? Ah, if you're anything like us, you may be feeling like this. We've definitely been here before. <laughs> You're like, great, I have all this research. I've, I've done this now. now. Now what? You're not alone. So when we look at what we want to be including, when we want to think about the research as we put a lesson plan together, what we can do is we can use the science of reading models. We can use the knowledge that we have of our cognitive development and the way that our brain works to structure those lessons. So again, we're thinking about semantics, phonology, orthography, and each of those individual skills and thinking about how we're incorporating that within each of our lessons. So key components. What we want to do is we want to make sure that we are focusing on instruction from the sound level all the way up through the passage and essay level and beyond. So what that looks like is it looks like instruction at the sound level, syllables, words, sentences, paragraphs, passages and essays. This is important because this has to happen throughout all of your grade levels. So this does not just happen that we start working on sounds in kindergarten and then we move up to syllables in first grade. It doesn't work like that. We need to hit this entire progression of components throughout the progression of our students' um, development as readers and writers. Now, when we think about how do these things align to the National Reading Panel and the research that they put together, essentially what we're saying is we're putting a systematic progression together that is supporting knowledge and phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. So you can see what's happening at each of these different levels from the sound level to the passage level. And you can see how we're ensuring that we're hitting all five core components throughout that progression with our students. So we have our lesson plan, which hopefully you've downloaded it. If not, make sure that you grab that using the button below. And what we want you to do is we want you to have that available so that we can start filling that out as we move on, because this guide is gonna break down all of the lesson components. And we're gonna talk about all of those skills that we need to target that full progression. You also wanna be mindful of timing. So depending on 
what setting you're in. If you're in an intervention setting, if you're in a special education setting, if you see students once per week, if you see students multiple times per week, you want to think about the time that you have available with your students and you want to use sort of those approximate times. And no, we've definitely said approximate times because every student or student group that you have is a little bit different, but this gives you a little bit of an idea of where you're spending that time and how you're breaking that up so that you can think about your setting specifically and know that if you see students four times per week, it might take you an entire week to get through this full progression. As we go through today, we will pause so that you can be filling out each of these boxes of the lesson planning guide. We will pull examples from lessons that we've completed with our own students, but know that depending on where you're at in a scope and sequence or what skills you're teaching, some of the activities in the examples will look a little bit different, which we'll talk about as we keep moving along. So as we jump into the how, we really want to get into the nitty gritty of how we're going to fill out each of those boxes of the lesson planning guide so that within one lesson, like Corey said, not necessarily one session, but one lesson, we can be targeting all of the core components of literacy, working from the sound to the syllable to the word and all the way up to passage in that stair step progression. So how do we put this all together? When we think about our lesson plans, we want them to be designed to target each of the areas of that literacy processing triangle with explicit instruction in each component. We need to work through that systematic and building progression. We want to be incorporating review of previously instructed skills, making sure that as we're working through our instruction, skills aren't coming in and then falling off, but students are maintaining that growth over time. And that we're targeting the full progression for both reading and for writing. Again, those reciprocal processes, we need to be hitting both. So when we think about creating the framework, the non-negotiables that the science of reading research says we need to be including are PA, phonics, vocabulary, reading fluency, and comprehension. We wanna make sure we're working through that entire stair-step progression, and we're working from sounds to passages for both reading and for writing. When we take a look at these specifically, the first thing that we want to be planning for is phonological awareness. So this is going to be that first box of your lesson planning guide. And the reason that we do phonological awareness is because it's activating that phonology part of the literacy processing triangle. And we're helping students build word recognition skills for reading and spelling by teaching them to recognize and manipulate their sounds and their syllables. We need students to have this understanding of how language comes together and the structure of the language. So when we're completing this, we're doing it with all ages. We're not only doing phonological awareness in kindergarten, but we're offering this as a quick skill warm up to activate that part of our brain, whether students are in kindergarten, in elementary, middle, or high school, if we're working in a literacy intervention or special education setting. One of the tips we found to help this feel cohesive in the lesson is to align it with the phonogram or phonics pattern that we're working on that day or in that lesson. So in our example here, we were working on an AR phonogram that week. And so all of our phonological awareness drills or all of those prompts include that AR pattern. This is a great way to integrate it into your lesson so it doesn't feel like you're pulling a PA prompt from one program or coming up with one and then jumping over to phonics, but helping students see how that's going to integrate. So go ahead and push pause, take the time that you need to start to think about what activities you can include in your lesson plan here to target whatever phonogram you're working on, to align with whatever skills you're working on. And remember, this is meant to be a quick activation activity. We present it as a warm up. We only spend a few minutes on it. So go ahead and push pause so you have time to fill out that part of the organizer. Welcome back. We're gonna jump into the sound drill next. And so when we think about the sound drill, we wanna make sure that we are explicitly showing students how to connect that phonology portion of the literacy processing triangle and the orthography portion. The sound drill is gonna start with the visual. So we're gonna start with that orthographic piece and students have to work to tie the sound to the visual component of our language. What that looks like is giving students either a sound drill card, 
or showing them a phonogram or letter and having them say sh or mm for the different patterns they're working on. This is not going to be as simple as just working through the alphabet and knowing what sounds the letters of the alphabet make, because depending on what pattern students are seeing, not all of our letters consistently make the same sound. If we look at T, for example, T will say T if it's on its own, but as soon as it's paired with an H, we lose that T sound and get T or Z. In TCH, we hear TCH. In T-I-O-N, we hear shun. And so we can't be tapping this out or decoding it as T. Students need to see that pattern as one unit. And so the sound drill helps to build that automaticity and the fluency at the sound level. So again, go ahead and push pause so you can be thinking about how you can include the sound drill in your lesson if it's something you've already been including, or if you haven't been, which patterns you're going to target first. Oftentimes we will start with the alphabet, those consonants and short vowel sounds, and then we'll start to add in those digraphs, the different syllable type patterns like R controlled patterns or vowel teams, things like blends or affixes even. This is also, like we said with phonological awareness, this is meant to be a quick warm up. It's an activation activity. So that's why we have the approximate time of five minutes that will vary, as we said before, based on your students or groups. But go ahead and push pause and take a second to think about how you can be including this in your instruction. So the last activation piece that we're thinking about, as Michaela mentioned, we were activating that phonology processor, we're activating that uh, orthography processor. The last piece that we want to activate is the semantics processor. And so one of the best ways to do that is to work through review material. So what exactly are we thinking about when we think about review material? Well, it's a systematic review of previously learned concepts. So that might be things like syllable types, words that's going to be helpful for students in their long-term retention. This is where we're making sure that we don't just keep moving on, but that we keep circling back so that they haven't forgot to close syllables, for example, as soon as you move on to vowel consonant E or R controlled syllables. So one of the things that we might want to be thinking about, again, is reviewing the different syllable types. Now sounds come together to create syllables and the way that we organize our scope and sequence is by syllable type so that we can help students with their working memory and their retention. So we definitely wanna take time to be reviewing those syllable types so that students remember what's a closed syllable, what's a vowel consonant E syllable, what is an R controlled syllable? And that can look a lot of different ways. That might look like looking at words and orthographically finding those syllable types. So find the closed syllables, or it might look like actually um, providing a word. So tell me a closed syllable. Tell me a vowel consonant E syllable. Go ahead and write that. Go ahead and build that. Sorry, I got excited and jumped ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Also, we can think about reviewing words. So when we're reviewing words, we might want to be considering both phonetically regular and irregular patterns. So if we're reviewing words, we will likely want to be thinking back to those syllable types. So um, for example, let's read some closed syllables if we've already moved on to a different syllable type. Or as we start progressing, we can go ahead and review those patterns that maybe students didn't have fully solidified or just as a confidence builder and a booster so that as they move into the new syllable type or the new pattern introduction, they can remember what they have already learned previously. This is a great place to also include um, some sight words uh, and things like that. So if you've been practicing some of those sight words or those phonetically irregular words, depending on how you wanna term those, um, that's a great place to include that instruction as well. So let's take a quick moment to reflect. How are you reviewing material in your lessons? What are the previous concepts that you've already gone over that you might want to include? Remember, this can be as simple as a word list. It might be a graphic organizer that you've covered before. It could be a game. We love incorporating games. This is oftentimes where we're incorporating games in our lesson because it's also something that gets students really engaged and excited to keep on moving. <laughs> done all of our activation and we've done activating phonology, activating orthography, and activating that semantics processor, then we're going to move into our new skill introduction. 
So when we think about new skills, we want to be thinking about what are the new skills that we need to be teaching. When we think about a systematic phonics-based progression, we're really thinking about new patterns of those phonograms and showing students how those apply at the sound level, the syllable level, and the word level. So for example, if we were teaching the AR pattern, we would start to see what does that look like at the sound level? What does that look like at the syllable level and beyond? Now, quick tip, we want to be thinking about organizing our scope and sequence by syllable types. So as I mentioned, this is really helpful for working memory. It's really helpful in retention. These are a lot of phonogram patterns. So, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is that there's 44 sounds in the English language, but there's over 250 orthographic patterns. So it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence and 250 things to try and memorize is just a lot. Um, and so if we can start to organize that by syllable type, it can be really helpful for students. Plus knowing the syllable type is gonna help them understand what vowel sound uh, is going to be occurring and it's gonna help support spelling as well. Absolutely. So when we're working on that AR phonogram, we would be completing that here with the R controlled syllables, as we're also then going to introduce O-R, E-R, I-R, U-R, some of these other all in a syllable type unit or a syllable type organizational kind of a unit or a chunk of lessons where we'll teach all of the patterns in that syllable type. So example, again, using that AR pattern, we would start by teaching students AR says R, as in car. And we would have them practice AR says R, AR says R, AR says R. We're practicing that at the sound level specifically. Then we can start to move that into words. We typically like to start with single syllable words, and then we like to move on to multisyllabic words as students are ready for that progression so that they can see what that looks like at each of those different levels. So let's take a quick moment to reflect. Is your current instruction organized by syllable type? If you are following a systematic phonics-based progression, how is that organized? Is that organized in a way that's supporting your students' working memory? What exactly does that look like? If not, no worries, but just think about, is that something that I could incorporate? What would that look like? And then let's think about what specific skill are you working on? So are you working through those phonogram patterns? If you're not sure exactly what that would look like, you can definitely take a look at our scope and sequence, which helps to understand what that progression might look like as you're thinking about that new skill introduction from that phonics-based recognition aspect. So once we've worked through that new skill introduction, we're going to take a minute to go through skill development activities with our students. This is where we really start to target our instruction and can get into any holes or gaps and support those for students that we're working with. Again, this is going to work primarily taking students from the sound to the syllable and word level, but really we're looking at student data here and student performance over time to see where they need the most support. This is something you can build right into your phonics instruction. So this being the same AR list that we just would have worked on a new skill introduction, we can start to look and see if students need more vocabulary support. We can have them find real or nonsense words. We can talk about multiple meaning words. If they need more phonological awareness support, we can pull in how to find rhyming words. We can ask them in the multi-syllable word list to find words with two or three syllables. We can target vocabulary with drawing pictures of words. Really, you have a lot of flexibility here and can integrate it right into that phonics list or into the words you're already working on to help it feel easy and cohesive as well. Games are another great way to target this, especially if you can start using them in more than one way. So if we were working on vowel teams that day and students are working with vowel teams to decode their words, if students need more fluency support, we can play a fluency game. We can define words that we pull for the game. We can use them in sentences to target writing. There's a lot of things you can target within your lesson here as well. So take a minute and think about where do your students need additional support? As you're starting to think about who in your group or which of your students need support in PA or vocabulary or any of these different skills, how can we then be adding activities into our lessons to target those skills? 
How can we help those feel cohesive in the instruction we're already delivering to our students? So take a second to think through that and you can jot some notes down in the literacy intervention planning guide. The next thing that we'll target in our lessons with students is vocabulary. And so when we are looking at the scope of our instruction or really the goals we have for our students, we work through a lot of phonics material. It's super important that students are able to decode their words. And it's equally as important that they understand what words mean. If we can decode a word, but we can't figure out how to derive meaning from it, we're, we've hit a wall. They can decode it, but they can't functionally use it. And functional usage and comprehension is our ultimate goal. And so one of the ways that we decide which words to define in our lessons and which words to target is to introduce a vocabulary knowledge rating scale to our students so they can build up their own metacognitive abilities and they can start to recognize what words they understand and what words they don't know. And so the way we organize this is at a level one, students would say, this might as well be a nonsense word. I have never heard it before. I cannot define it at all. I don't know anything about it. A two, or if we move our thumb up just a little bit, maybe that they've heard this word, they might be able to say it's a thing or it's an action, but they really can't provide more than that. They're really not sure what it actually means. A three would be, I'm familiar with this word. I can use it in a sentence or can tell you a little bit about it, but I'm not fully confident I can fully explain what it is. And a four or a thumbs up, I know this word, I can provide a full definition with a category, a function, a synonym, and an antonym or shade of meaning. And so as we're working through our decoding words or our word list with students, we'll ask them to rate their knowledge of words. Are there any words that you're at a two or a one? Are there any words you don't know? As they start to identify those words, we can have them define those. At first, we might need to be pulling some words or defining a few extra to make sure they have that metacognitive knowledge or metacognition, but this is a great way to help them buy in and select the words for what we're going to define. Instead of then looking up a definition and memorizing it, we like to use a framework with students to support better understanding. So for example, if the student selected the word park, or if that's one we chose to use in our vocabulary instruction, we would start with the category. A park is a place. The function of this word is it's a place that you go to to have fun. It's kind of like a yard. That would be our synonym. But our antonym or shade of meaning would be it has equipment. Some words like park don't have a clear opposite or a really distinct antonym. And so we use this shade of meaning how is it different than a yard to help distinguish those two words from each other? This is a great word too, thinking of that one, because you'll have students who will define that differently too. And that's a great opportunity to say, oh, I was thinking park is an action. It's something you do when you want to stop. It's the opposite of go. And that's where you can start to build that multiple meaning and really build up that vocabulary development for students. <laughs> Sorting the words that students are reading or spelling into parts of speech is another really easy way to incorporate vocabulary into your lessons. And so you can have them actually move the words like they do here, whether you print and cut out your word lists, or if you highlight them in different colors, having students just identify which of them are nouns, verbs, or adjectives and adverbs can help them start to incorporate or help you start to incorporate that vocabulary into your lessons. So let's take a minute and reflect. Is vocabulary something that you're currently targeting in your lessons? And if not, how can you build vocabulary practice into what you're already doing? It doesn't have to be a whole new edition of word lists or a whole new section, but really just what are some quick activities you can do to help support that semantics processor and vocabulary development? So the next thing that we want to think about once we have really targeted that vocabulary and we're clear that students not only are decoding the words, but that they're also thinking about the meaning of the words is starting to progress that into sentence level reading. So thinking about fluency and comprehension here. 
Now, when we're thinking about fluency and comprehension, again, we want to make sure that students are applying their phonics knowledge in context because sometimes they can do it in isolation. And then as soon as you put it into connected text, it breaks apart a little bit. So we want to make sure that we're providing that opportunity for students. But what this starts to do is it's starting to create that entire connection of the literacy processing triangle here. So one of the activities that we like to do at the sentence level is we want students to do a few things. One, we want them to recognize those phonics patterns. Where are those phonics patterns that we just previously instructed? Where do they exist? We want them thinking about vocabulary. Are there any words in here that you do not understand? Again, it's that great metacognitive skill that's starting to build that executive functioning and that active self-regulation that we need. We need to be thinking about syntax or structure. How is this sentence structured? We want to be visualizing for meaning. So creating kind of a picture in our head after we've read each sentence. And then we also want to be thinking about reading with proper phrasing, expression, to the punctuation. If there is punctuation in there, we want to be making sure that we are attending to that. So for example, if we have the sentence, the car will park next to the park, students could recognize that AR pattern that they had just previously worked through. They can also start to think about the different pieces of their sentence. So as we start to think about that syntax, who or what? The car, did what, will park, where, next to the park. So what we're seeing is we're starting to break that sentence up into its individual chunks, which one, creates nice prosody because you get a little baby pause uh, in between each of those, but also it's starting to build our comprehension. We are starting to comprehend by thinking about each of those individual pieces we can visualize. We can think about, can I visualize a car? Can I visualize what it will look like to park? Can I visualize what a park looks like? What does that look like in my head? Is it something I could draw if I was pulled up for Pictionary, which can be a fun activity too. <laughs> and I think something to note here that's really important is oftentimes when we think of fluency at the sentence or passage level, we're often thinking about rate or how quickly students can read as well as accuracy. This activity is going to help pull in all of the other pieces of fluency where we are reading with proper phrasing. It sounds like spoken language because that's going to be what in turn supports comprehension. And so not just reading these sentences quickly, not just reading them correctly, but doing all the things Corey mentioned so that we're better supporting students overall understanding. And it's great to even have students think about what would it be if we had an exclamation? What would it be mm -hmm. if we had a question? The car will park next to the park. You can start to think through some of that and it provides a great opportunity for repeated reads because each time they're reading it, they're reading it a little bit differently, which is starting to build up fluency as well. So let's take a quick pause and think about how can you incorporate activities to support all of those fluency skills? So not just the rate and the accuracy, but also the prosody, the intonation, understanding sentence syntax, knowing that this is so much more than just being able to read quickly, but really truly being able to comprehend as we're reading. We've moved through the sentence level, we wanna move into the passage level. So thinking about fluency and comprehension with connected sentences will be our next step. Comprehension is always our end goal. That's why we read. We read to comprehend. So all the work that we're doing is making sure that we can get there. So again, we're thinking about reading comprehension. We're moving kind of from that sentence into the paragraph, passages, and essays level. So what does that look like? When we do our instruction, we are using our pattern aligned passages. So we're trying to make sure that we've got an opportunity to review that phonogram pattern that we've been targeting, but you can also use authentic text. And hopefully you're gonna be finding those patterns in authentic text, they're there, they exist. So one of the things that we like to do is have students recognize or find those patterns. So let's circle it, let's highlight it. Let's see if we can't find that pattern in our connected text. And then what we're going to do is we are going to take that opportunity to read those passages. And especially if we've got um, patterns that are using or passages that are using a lot of those patterns, we can be focusing on repeated reads. It's a great way to build fluency. Sometimes people worry like, oh, they're just memorizing. That's okay to an extent. Part of the purpose here is for them to feel what it feels like to sound like spoken language, to build up that confidence so that they are using those strategies. 
What we're looking for, though, is that those cold reads or those non-practiced, non-repeated reads are starting to improve in rate and accuracy as we go. One of the things that we're also doing is we're making sure that we are explicitly talking about comprehension strategies. So there's different types of comprehension. It's often all lumped together, but we really do want to be thinking about the different levels of comprehension in the same way that we think about the different levels of, you know, syllable types. Um, and so in this case, we like to think about vocabulary and context. Again, are students able to recognize words that they don't know? Can we go back to that vocabulary instruction that we had and recognize that even when we're not at the word level, but we're actually seeing this in connected text? Can we think about direct recall? So who or what, did what, when, where, why, and how? Are we able to sequence the information or kind of organize that information effectively? Can we think about what the main idea of that was? Can we start to make connections? Can we think about background knowledge? Can we think about text to text, text to self, text to world connections, compare and contrast, cause and effect? Then can we make a leap with that information? Can we make inferences? Can we make predictions? And then finally, can we analyze that? Can we think about, does this align with what I know? Do I agree with this? Does this seem like a reputable source? What, what moral do I take from this? Or what lesson can I take from this as I move forward? And those are the things that we want to be providing. Um, and so just simply by making sure that we're explicitly providing these strategies will help students to be able to comprehend more effectively. Graphic organizers are a fabulous way to do this. So again, we had our structured comprehension guide, um, which is a great way to guide kind of the use of those graphic organizers. But then as you get into each of the graphic organizers themselves, you can start to show what that looks like so that students can visualize and really think about the information in a very clear way. So let's take a quick moment and reflect. Are you providing students that opportunity to develop fluency? Are we providing opportunities to explicitly teach them how to comprehend text? It's amazing to be giving passages and then asking comprehension questions. But what we also want to do is we want to make sure if students are consistently missing questions, let's analyze what kind of questions are those and what type of graphic organizer might be really helpful or what type of instruction might be helpful. So in the lesson planning guide, we have a few different things that you can think about and just make sure that you are providing that explicit instruction to students or looking specifically for their ability across those different areas. So now that we've gone from sounds to passages for reading, we start back at sounds to make sure we're also hitting that writing process as well. The auditory drill is one of the first things that we'll do on a day that we're targeting writing or to support that stair-step progression for writing. We want to make sure that we are completing this, even though it is really similar to the sound drill, it's just the reciprocal process, because it's the opposite connection in the brain. So in the sound drill, like we mentioned at the beginning, we're starting with orthography and tying in phonology. Students see a pattern and then have to produce the sound. The auditory drill is going to build that connection from the opposite end. We're going to start by giving students a sound and having them produce the visual component, that letter or pattern that will make that sound. And so we like to do this before spelling, where we'll ask students to provide the letter or patterns for sounds that they've previously been taught. So for example, if we were working on AR, students would have already learned that Z says Z in the alphabet. Double Z will say Z as a floss rule. S between two vowels can say Z in a magic E or VCE syllable. And so we're giving them the sounds and having them identify, again, that visual pattern. So it's a quick warm up activation activity to do before spelling. Again, it should be fast, just like the sound drill up at the beginning was a quick activation activity. So let's think about is this something that you're currently completing in your lessons? If not, is it something that you can be adding? As you start to add it, what are the previously taught patterns you can review? Oftentimes I give my students 10 total patterns. And so as we work through more and more new skills, we don't review every single pattern every week, but we'll cycle them through. And if I notice students are really struggling with a specific concept, TCH for example, I have one student who that's a continued sticky skill, I add that into the auditory, auditory drill each week to make sure we're consistently reviewing it. So take a minute to pause, 
Think about your own students and what previously taught patterns you can be adding in to review as a part of that auditory drill. The next step in the progression is going to hit spelling. And so spelling is going to move from sounds into syllables, mostly into words. In this section of the lesson, we're going to target both new pattern spelling and review spelling. And so we want to be teaching those patterns. We want to be reviewing the previously taught patterns so that we're ensuring that students can consistently apply them. As we start looking at the new pattern, some students are going to need more of a challenge than others. Some are going to need more support. And so one of the best things we've done in our own lessons with students is to have pre-differentiated lists so that whenever we teach a new pattern, it's easy enough for us to pull from those lists and scaffold that instruction or differentiate the spelling task to best fit students' needs. So if a student is still really needing a lot of support, we can start with list A. They're much more simple. They're easier words. And then we can build in that difficulty for students that need a bit more of a challenge. Something else that we want to do here is making sure that we explici explicitly, excuse me, show students how their PA skills and their auditory drill apply to their spelling words. And so in our phonological awareness drill that we would have previously completed as a part of the lesson, we would have worked on syllable segmenting and phoneme segmenting, where we're figuring out how many syllables we hear in a word and how many sounds. Then in the auditory drill, we start to think about what patterns make those sounds. This is going to be how we set the foundation for spelling words that students can sound out and really start putting together based on that phonics knowledge that they've been instructed with. So take a second, go ahead and take a quick pause and think about as a part of your spelling, what review words and patterns should you be including? And then what pattern are you currently working on? What words that align with that pattern, if we're thinking about those differentiated lists, are going to be most appropriate for your students to use in your spelling list. And then again, once we focus on sound level instruction and word level instruction, we want to take that out of isolation and move that into connected text, or in this case, connected writing. So sentence level writing would be our next step in that progression. Students need not only that explicit instruction in spelling, but they also need instruction in sentence structure and grammar, right? So sometimes students can put that ability. I'm not sure if it froze for everybody there. You did freeze on my screen, Corey. Do you want to just repeat what you said just in case? Yeah, so I was just saying that we want to make sure that students are having an opportunity to work through their sentence structure and grammar as well. So not just those patterns in isolation, but also moving into that sentence level and that structure. So one of the things that we want to be thinking about is what does that look like? What does it look like to build ability at the sentence level? There are three key skills that we work on in our lessons, including sentence building. And so sentence building is an opportunity for students to write their own sentences. So this is going to be content generation and then thinking about what are my ideas and how do I get my ideas out? We also want to be thinking about sentence combining. So how do we start to combine sentences together so that we can start working on and, but, so, for, and making more complex sentences as students start progressing. And then we want to be thinking about sentence dictation. So sentence dictation is simply where we provide a sentence and students just write it so that they can be focusing on their grammar and mechanics, their capitals, the appearance, the meaning of the sentence, the punctuation and the spelling and making sure they've got all of those pieces correct. So bringing that back to that beginning piece, sentence building. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll use an opportunity to build in that phonogram pattern so that students can start to spell using the words that we want them to spell, but also thinking about how they can incorporate words appropriately. So for example, if they had the word car, start, and far, they would try to put together a sentence that includes all of these different pieces. So this student put, we started driving to a place far away. 
this is super helpful because one, we can see what are their ideas and what are their thoughts, but also there's some executive functioning here because they forgot to use the word car. They were probably thinking we started driving a car to a place far away, but that's a great opportunity to build in some of that executive functioning while also giving them the opportunity to structure their sentence in that, you know, who or what, did what, when, where, why, or how. Also thinking again about that sentence combining. So as I said, this is an opportunity to start creating more complex sentences, moving away from just that who or what, did what, when, where, why, or how. How can we combine sentences effectively? We can start to do that again by thinking about that who or what, did what, when, where, why, or how, but we might want to start dropping off again some of those subjects and predicates if those two things are the same. So this is just an opportunity to see how are students combining um, more complex sentences together. And then finally, we talk about sentence dictation. So sentence dictation is that opportunity, again, for us to be able to read a sentence out loud to them and have them just simply write it. This takes out the need for them to think about content generation. It takes out the need for them to have to think about uh, meaning and sentence structure so that we can really truly just focus on those mechanics. Did we have a capital? Did we have a punctuation? Does it look good? And so that's the three different types of sentence level instruction that we provide in our lessons. Again, editing is super important. And so one of the things that we do is we use acronyms or visuals to help students to be able to kind of keep a mental checklist. So this is an executive functioning strategy that's going to help them to be able to utilize the strategies that we're talking about. For example, we use the word camps to help them remember to check for capitals, appearance, meaning, punctuation, and spelling. There are a lot of different acronyms you can use. There's no perfect acronym. Whatever you use is great, but just make sure to stay consistent for your students. So quick reflection, if you were to pick one or two of these sentence level activities to start with, what would that look like in your lesson? How might you incorporate some of those different strategies into your lesson? And the last piece we've got here is paragraph level writing. So paragraph level writing, we typically start with students around second grade, but definitely as your students are ready for this, this is something that you can start to incorporate. But we think about providing explicit instruction in different types of writing. So thinking about narrative, informative, opinion, persuasive, and writing summaries. Typically, we like to use graphic organizers. This is a fabulous way to help students understand the different paragraph structures and to help them organize their writing. So what we might start with is something very simple. If we're starting with narrative, for example, what are your characters? What's the problem? What's the solution? And then what we can do is we can start to create more and more detail within that structure so that students can start to see what that should look like. And they can start simple and then advance as they're ready. Let's take a quick moment to reflect. So reflect. <laughs> if you were going to pick one paragraph structure to start with, what would that look like? Would you start with narrative, informative, persuasive? Typically, we have a specific organization that we like to follow, which you can see right here in the lesson planning guide. But again, wherever your students are at, that is perfect. Absolutely. And something to note here to help this feel cohesive in your lesson is as you're working through these different paragraph structures, you can include the key phonics pattern that you've been teaching in the prompt. That way, as the student's writing it, they're still working to apply that AR pattern or whatever pattern you're teaching in context at that paragraph level. So think about, like Corey said, what you would pick to start out with, what that might look like, and then what prompt you could use to align that phonics pattern that you're working on. You can also give them words that they have to include. Um, and that's another way to, it's a fun executive functioning <laughs> activity as well. Um, and just one more way to get all of that in there. Sorry, my mouse is going back and forth. <laughs> so go ahead and take a second to pause. Go ahead and reflect on that, and then we'll jump back in. So the last piece that we have is the what if. So what if, if we are feeling like this is all awesome, um, and it also feels time consuming. Let's go ahead and talk through some of that. So now that we have our lesson plan put together, we want to reflect a little bit further. So one of the things that we want to reflect on is finding materials for your lesson. Do you have the materials that you need? Are you going to need to create these materials? Where are these materials coming from? 
And then we also want to think about completing these lesson plans for every student or every group that you have throughout the year and just making sure that that feels manageable for you. So if you're feeling good, amazing. That is fabulous. Uh, we hope that this planning guide is helpful as you work through your intervention this year. We hope that just thinking about each of those different components helps make sure that if there was anything that maybe you weren't including before, that you feel a little bit more comfortable incorporating into your lessons now. But if you're maybe feeling, like I said, like, oh, that feels like a lot, or I just don't have enough time to write the plans and find the materials or the materials that I have maybe aren't going to align very well uh, to the science of reading approach, or you're just unsure of how to make all of these components fit together cohesively. So maybe you've got a bunch of different programs that you could kind of stitch together to make that work, but it's going to feel a little disjointed because you're using one program for PA and one program for your word list and one program for your comprehension. Um, that might be something we really want to think about because it's breaking your cohesion of your lessons. We get it. <laughs> Planning lessons for all of your students and groups and finding the materials, like I said, from all the different programs that you have or all the different trainings you've attended feels a lot like this. You're just like, oh my gosh, I'm sorting through all the things. <laughs> and we also get it that when your lessons don't feel cohesive, it's hard for your students to make that connection. So even though you're making that connection, your students aren't. You know all the pieces that you're working towards to try and get that literacy processing triangle to come together but they don't see that connection. And if they don't see that connection, it can definitely impact their growth or it can impact their retention. So sometimes you might see growth in the short term, but they don't retain that growth. They don't maintain it. Um, and so then it's harder for them to continue to build on top of it. So that cohesion, again, is super important. In. Again, you're not alone. <laughs> we struggled for years figuring out how to do this, doing exactly that, piecemealing all of the different pieces together um, to try and hit on everything. We spent a ton of time trying to find the PA activities, the phonics activities, the vocabulary, the fluency, the comprehension, the writing. And again, th then trying to figure out what do we do to make this have a through line so that it does not feel like we're just doing a bunch of random different activities. Truly, we knew that there had to be a better way to do this. And so, painstakingly, <laughs> we built the solution. And so we want to share more about it. And so if you're feeling like, yes, things definitely feel like an issue for me, stick around and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. It is our Delivering Smarter Intervention program, which is our done for you structured lessons and training that are truly going to get you the results that you're looking for while also creating that cohesion and then you don't have to worry about the lesson plan um, and filling it out because it's already put together for you. So in the Delivering Smarter Intervention Program, you get access to nine levels of curriculum and instruction that's going to span, span through grades K through 12 for students in an intervention setting. Within each level, you get access to 16 lessons that follow a structured and systematic progression of concepts and every single lesson is designed to cohesively incorporate phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, reading fluency, comprehension, and writing instruction, using that phonics through line so it all feels cohesive, it all comes together, but it's already all built out and aligned for you. Each level also comes with three built-in assessments so that you can progress monitor students' skills across all of those core components of literacy and see where they're at from the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of each level if you're looking for progress monitoring data, IEP data, RTI, MTSS, if you are looking to get scores to track that growth. Each lesson will deliver an online access to an instructor manual, a ready-to-print student workbook, an interactive digital version of that student workbook in case you want to put it on the whiteboard and work alongside your students or if you're seeing students virtually. It also comes with games for every single lesson, home practice activities for every lesson, and additional materials for each of those as well. Also, you get our comprehensive structured literacy training that has modules that will address both the background, the research, the cognitive neuroscience and key strategies of science of reading and evidence-based instruction, but also very concrete and tactical how-to implementation videos.
That way you know how to deliver each component of the lesson confidently. You feel comfortable delivering, whether you're in a one-on-one, -on -one, small group or large group setting. It has all of the pieces in there for you to reference and to learn from. But it's so much more than just a curriculum and a training. It's also going to be a community. Members of the program get an invitation into our online community where you can ask questions and talk with other folks using the program all over the world. And you'll also have access to ongoing monthly coaching calls. These are held live. So if you wanna come and chat with our team, you're welcome to join us live. Or you can submit questions that we'll answer on the call and watch those on the replay if the timing doesn't line up with your availability. That way you have the training, you have the materials, and you have the ongoing support so that you can deliver this instruction with confidence and get the results that you've always wanted for your students. With DSI, not only you get access to all of that great stuff, but also you're gonna have the opportunity to maximize student results. So on average, students were seeing 12 standard score points of growth on a combined reading and spelling measure in a 12 month interval. So again, that is massively closing the gap for students such that they get to a point where they can start to graduate out of their IEPs and graduate out of those tier two and tier three supports. Again, this is equating to nearly two full grade levels of growth in one academic year. So you can see tons of growth in even six months, but you can see massive growth within the year. Also, you're gonna be able to save time planning. So using the Delivering Smarter Intervention program, 95% of surveyed educators said that they saved time planning and over 30% of the educators said that they saved over five hours a week because everything is already planned and scripted for you. So this is massive. And finally, you're gonna have a cohesive system. So again, using that Delivering Smarter Intervention Program, 90% of our surveyed educators said that they had much increased lesson cohesion when compared to other literacy programs. So again, there's, there are materials designed to support PA, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, comprehension, and writing in each lesson. It's all done for you already. So what makes it different from some of the other programs that maybe you're considering? First and foremost, it's a comprehensive approach. So many programs are going to target individual components of literacy, and then you're left trying to put the pieces together. But with Smarter Intervention, you're going to have everything that you need to be able to put that together cohesively in a simple and sensible way. <laughs> also, there are dynamic lessons. So what we mean by this is that the research is ever evolving and your instruction should be too. And so what we're constantly doing is we are constantly providing additional supports and additional materials that you may need to help support your students. So for example, when COVID hit, we went ahead and turned everything digital so that you would be able to work with your students in a remote and digital fashion. Now, I know that I have a lot of books that just gather a bunch of dust on the shelf um, because they've become outdated or maybe um, some of the passages don't feel like they align very well. Um, and so what we're doing is we're constantly making sure that if anything starts to feel a little dusty, um, we dust that off, clean it up and push new content out for you. So you get automatic updates. You don't need to resubscribe or upgrade. It all gets delivered right into the library for you. And we truly believe that you'll have an unparalleled experience. So it's more than just a curriculum. It's more than just a training program. It's a community. There's ongoing support. We work with students directly. We're always in this with you. So when we see things are changing with students, we hear it. We get together in the coaching calls. And um, it truly is an amazing opportunity to, to have an experience and to be a part of a community. And there's no annual fees. So once you get in, you are a lifetime member. You have a one-time payment and you're going to have access to the training and the curriculum forever. So another note about the program is it is a READ Act approved curriculum for an intervention, an intervention program or a supplemental instructional program. We did go through that READ Act approval process, which is through the Colorado Department of Education, and got both those accreditations. So you can be sure you're delivering a tried and tested curriculum. 
So if you are thinking about how you can claim your license, we do have two different options for you to be able to purchase access to the program. We work with individuals who want to get the program for themselves. We also work with schools who will purchase the program on behalf of their staff. If you are interested in an individual license, you have a payment plan option and a pay in full discount option. Both of these provide you access to all of the same materials, to the training, the monthly coaching calls, the community. You just get to choose which payment option is the best fit for you. The payment plan is $99 a month for 12 months. Your access does start at that initial payment. You don't need to wait until 12 months, but you can split out that payment over the course of the year. The pay in full discount does give you a nearly $200 discount to the total price of the program, and that is $997 as a one-time fee. If you are from a school and your school is interested in using the program, we've worked with hundreds of school districts to bring this intervention to their students. And you can go to www.smarterintervention.com forward slash school services, and we can put together a custom quote for you. So if you are thinking about jumping in, we do also have a monthly, this month only option for you where we are going to give you a free Science of Reading starter kit when you purchase a license to the program. So anybody who jumps in in December of 2023 is going to get access to the Source starter kit. Corey, do you wanna jump in and share what's included? Yes, yeah, so it's so fun, I think, in this digital era. It's so fun to get things directly to your door. So in the starter kit, you will get a PA drill card deck super fun to be able to incorporate into your instruction. You'll also get a phonogram sound deck that has all of our phonogram patterns that you can use within your instruction for your students that targets both the phonograms as well as the affix patterns or the morphology um, that you might include into your instruction as well. We have vocabulary and comprehension anchor charts that are awesome to be able to explicitly teach those comprehension strategies that are included within the program. Graphy magnet sets that you can see behind us. We use these all the time with our students. These are great for review and incorporating that as well as our syllable type poster, which I can't see it, but we definitely <laughs> use that again for the uh, review and just having students really start to put those pieces together. And we don't sell it anywhere else. This is the only way to get access to it. So it's over hundred dollars of value of things that you can start using immediately with your students. So we want this to be, <laughs> sorry, I thought it was lagging there for a second. We want this to be a no brainer. And that's why we offer a 100% no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. We know that investing in a program can feel scary. We know you may have invested in other programs before, or you've been thinking about this one. And so if for any reason you jump in and it's not exactly what you wanted or exactly what you're looking for, just let us know within that 30 day time period and we'll refund all of your money to you. We don't want there to be any hiccups for you to jumping in. So with that, you can learn more at www.smarterintervention.com forward slash DSI dash curriculum. We'll also put more information below this video for you to check out. And if you jump in before the end of this month, before the end of 2023 on December 31st, you will get sent that SOAR starter kit. We hope that this lesson planning guide, this training was helpful for you. We wish you all the best of luck in planning your lessons. And if you want the lessons done for you, you're looking for a comprehensive done for you system with a training, with a community, with ongoing support, we'd love to invite you into the DSI program. We'd love, yes, to welcome you into the community and thank you again for everything that you do for your students and everything that you do every day. If you don't hear it often enough, hopefully you are moving into the new year knowing that you make a massive, massive difference. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to chatting more with all of you soon.